Hi guys, thanks for listening. Thank you as well to those of you who donate to the Patreon account. I've launched a campaign to raise funds to buy a new iMac. My current computer has been in use for over 8 years, and it is affecting my ability to create new content. As previously stated, my Patreon account can be found at www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one l-e-a-d-e-r-o-n-e for those of you who would prefer to make a one-time single donation there is also the option to send money to my paypal account the email address to send it to is morgan rector my last name spelled r-e-c-t-o-r 331 morgan rector 331 at hotmail.com remember any amount is fine if one dollar one time is all you wish to donate it would be gratefully accepted. Thank you for all your support, whatever forms it has taken. Enjoy the show. Everybody, welcome to the True Crime News. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is our, actually our second time recording our first stories because I'm I'm out of it. I Did too it, am out of it, so please bear with us. We're doing about, this anyway for you for y'all. <laughs> the but universe is all fucky. All kinds it's been of, a real shit week this yeah. past week. Yeah, and we're both it nicely. We're, we're both a little uh, thrown off course, so to speak. Um, yep. So here, Uncle B, here, I'm going to read my story all over again. Uh, so my first one uh, is out of Pakistan. Uh, an eight-year-old boy faces death penalty in Pakistan for blasphemy after peeing on carpet. Uh, he is the youngest person to ever be charged with this. An eight-year-old Hindu, Hindu boy in Pakistan, he could be executed after being charged with blasphemy. He is accused of intentionally urinating on a carpet. At a madrasa. How could it be intentional when you're eight? I don't know. Like, they have to have washrooms there. I don't see how he, he would just go and do it on the carpet. I mean, I guess it would have yeah. to. I don't know. That's inter- Okay. I mean, that. well, it must be a deliberate act because, I mean, when I was eight years old, I knew better. Than you knew better. Was, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, if you're developing at the, the usual rate as a human being, you're going to know that. Yeah. So, and then there have been tensions between Hindus and Muslims for a long time. So maybe he internalized it and expressed it the wrong way. Uh, doesn't say that that happened, but um, this is that's an that's a really egregious offense uh, to do that to urinate at any spot in a madrasa aside from the washrooms. Um, I mean, this is a place where women menstruating women are not allowed to pray with the men. Right. That's what right. It's up there. Uh, so, yeah, religious books are kept there, and it's a, it's a religious Islamic school. The boy was released on bail last week, triggering an outraged Muslim mob to attack a Hindu temple. Twenty arrests were made after troops were sent in to quell the unrest. The boy's family are now in protective custody, and they were forced to flee their homes in Punjab. Um, I don't know if that's in Pakistan. I'm pretty sure that's part of India. But, yeah, I mean, Pakistan so. is next door to India, and I think it was formerly an Indian state. I'm not entirely sure how that works. I can't keep uh, up with all that stuff, man. Yeah, I, I don't know. I with my own shit. It's hard enough. Yeah, I don't know all the geopolitics of it. But, <laughs> the child is the youngest ever in the country to be charged with blasphemy, which is punishable by death. Um, but the fa- the boy's family insists that he didn't even know what he did wrong. Uh as they said, uh, he is not even aware of such blasphemy issues, and he has been falsely indulged in these matters. Uh, one family member told the publication uh, from an undisclosed location, because obviously they're fearing for their lives, 
He still doesn't understand what his crime was and why he was kept in jail for a week. Uh, we have left our shops and work. The entire community is scared and we fear backlash. We don't want to return to this area. We don't see any concrete and meaningful action will be taken against the culprits or to safeguard the minorities living here. And as I was saying to, to Rachel the first time around, uh, it just seems odd to me that the child wouldn't know better. When I was eight years old, I didn't just go around uh, urinating in a cavalier fashion in Correct. any indoor structure. Whether my, it was my son's going to be eight on actually Friday. And he absolutely knows better than to not urinate in yeah. the indoor structure. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure you'd be pretty humiliated if you did, right? Oh, putting it mildly, yes. Well, yeah, because because what what happens when a kid acts up in public? Everyone looks at the parent, right? Of course. So, have, have you had that kind of attention where your one of your kids like did something they didn't realize was? Um, I think when my littlest was in preschool. Oh God, I'm trying to remember. I think he, he, he was a, like a nudist when he was little. So he yeah. was little, little. And I think he had taken, was trying to take his pants off, have it in his underpants on still, but, and we were like in the middle of a ceremony or, or presentation or something like that. And I'm like, oh my God, no, no, son, you know, get over here. But he was like just a toddler. Uh, he knows better now. Yeah. A lot of kids are really into public nudity. <laughs> As we all want to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did. Well, I mean, it's, I guess sometimes some of them do the thing where it's like you set up the sprinkler on the lawn and they yeah. run through it in the water, but you just have to make sure to tell them, you know, you can't do that everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> just on the lawn. All right. So what's your next, your first story, rather? Oh, yeah. My first story, um, uh, I was, so it's hot, you know, we're in the middle of August in, in Florida. So it's super in the South, uh, the dog days of summer, as we like to call them. Um, so this story came across, I think it was actually um, in one of my pop-up stories. And so I was gonna, thought it was interesting. Uh, two coaches charged with murder after a high schooler suffered a heat stroke and died, <clears throat> which is a heavy charge, like murder. Time, yeah. Um, this was in Jonesboro, Georgia. So hot as hell. A grand jury, and this was actually happened last year, but their fi the uh, family's filing uh, is just now filing suit. <clears throat> a grand jury has charged two co coaches with murder and child cruelty and the death of a Georgia high school basketball player who suffered a heat stroke after practicing outdoors in nearly 100 degree weather, an attorney for the player's family said Tuesday. The Atlanta area grand jury indicted LaRosa Walker Askier and Dwight Palmer last month, according to court records and news outlets. Amani Bell, a 16-year-old junior at Elite Scholars Academy in Clayton County, was participating in required conditioning drills for the girls' basketball team on August 13, 2019, when she collapsed after running up the football stadium steps, according to a lawsuit her family filed in February against administrators at the school. The temperature was in the high 90s Fahrenheit, and that's more than 35 degrees Celsius for the Canadians that are listening and anyone else who yeah. uses the metric system. <laughs> And the area was under a heat advisory. And I wanted to explain that we do get heat advisories here. It's almost like a, it's a weather alert. It, you know, if there's a strong thunderstorm or a tornado or a hurricane, heat advisories are also a thing because it gets so hot that they warn you not to go outside unless you absolutely have to. That because, yeah. yeah, it's just too much, especially for like elderly people or young people, you know, not let's not go take a run during these times. It's just the heat's so intense that you can cause you to have heat stroke or any norm number of things and flip and die. That's the dead dog's days of the, summer. The, the dog, yeah, the dog days of summer, the dead dog days of summer. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, um. Um, Amani died later that day of heat-related cardiac arrest and kidney failure, according to the suit. Fuck. Justin Miller, an attorney for the girl's family, said Tuesday that the indictment, quote, sends a signal that the DA is taking this seriously, end quote. His office had received a copy of it. But he added that he wants to see the case move ahead swiftly. The point of the case is the prosecution, not just the charges, he said. Miller identified 
Walker a skier as the head basketball coach and Palmer as the assistant. And he said both were on site at the time of the charge and in charge of the children. Sorry. Uh, court documents do not list an attorney for either defendant and Clayton County prosecutors did not immediately return an email seeking that information and details about the indictment. Messages for attorneys listed for Walker a skier in a separate case were also not immediately returned. The family's lawsuit says school officials violated a Georgia High School Association rule banning outdoor practices in weather conditions such as those that Amani faced. It also says they never properly measured the temperature in advance. The school district also declined to comment. Well, you don't need a thermometer to measure that it's way too fucking it, hot outside uh, to run up. Y- correct. <laughs> Yeah. 100 <laughs> fucking percent. You can walk outside yeah. right now and I will go ahead and fucking tell you it's too hot to do yeah. shit. Like to even so, walk to the car. Some there are times in life when you don't need science, you know what I'm saying? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> just, just use common sense. And that kind of heat, like I'd be bummed out if an escalator wasn't working, you know. <laughs> Dude, I am bummed out when I have to leave the house to go pick my kids up. And yeah. I'm walking maybe 15 to 20 feet to my car. And getting an air conditioning, but those 15 to 20 feet and the 30 seconds before the AC kicks on are grueling. Yeah, totally. You are sweating profusely. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So, well, see how that, that goes. All right, my next, do you ever go shopping at Cracker Barrel? Oh my God, ha- yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I oh, think I know it's, oh my God, okay, go. By the way, is it, now, did the brand name, did that precede the Cracker Bill stores, or was it the other way around? No, I'm pretty – I just wrote a story about this, actually. It's funny we, you say that. We don't have the Cracker Barrel stores here, but we had the brand name, like the, the cheese and all that shit. Yeah, it's supposed uh, – it's a, it's a racist term. Oh, really? Oh. I actually just learned this on TikTok, <laughs> believe well, it or story, not. Your story may differ from mine. Okay. Uh, my headline is uh, – Group of dads tackle sex offender who was peeping at a teen in a cracker cracker barrel bathroom. Uh, oh, and and this oh, it's creepier than it even sounds. Get a load of this. Jesus, I'm terrified. When a 15 year old girl told her dad that a strange man poked his head under her bathroom stall, a group of fathers made sure the peeping tom couldn't get away. On Sunday afternoon. A teenage girl frantically rushed back to her father's table at a South Carolina Cracker Barrel to tell him that a strange man had poked his head under her bathroom stall to ogle at her. You know, it's bad enough if it's the window gig with the with the chair, but to have the fucking head like stick out like that, that would be fucking freaky. Like she is probably going to avoid public washrooms for at least 10 years now. You know? Or if not the rest of her life, and I'm not meaning to laugh, but I cannot imagine a worst place to do this than in South Carolina at a Cracker Barrel yeah. because those bitches are going to take you out. Those dads are not messing around. Like, you, what is oh, yeah. it's the worst place you could possibly choose? Well, it says her dad and a group of his friends. Oh, hell yeah. All guys then found and restrained the man who has since been exposed as a convicted sex offender. Great. Uh, the incident took place at a franchise on Main Street in the town of Duncan. Police Chief Carl Long explained that the 15-year-old girl was in town for a softball tournament. She first noticed something moving in her peripheral vision oh. near her feet while she was in the bathroom. She then realized out. it was a man's head looking up at her. Oh, my God. I would freak out. That would be the end of me. It's not as bad as the one where the guy got went to the camping site and got down into the sewage underneath a public toilet oh jesus that's another fear of mine don't say that i don't want to hear that story don't ever say that that. no i don't want to know that no (laughs) no all right so even though he was enraged by what his daughter had just told him the girl's father had the wherewithal to ask a female employee to get the man out of the bathroom to make matters worse however his daughter wasn't the only girl in the bathroom which made it unclear whether this was an isolated incident. Uh, what a witness said of the girls, I'll never forget the way they looked after. They were traumatized. So the offender has since been identified as 53-year-old Douglas Lane of Charlotte, North Carolina. Dude. Immediately tried to escape after the teenage girl informed her father of what had happened. 
How, unfortunately for him, however, Chief Long explained that the teenager's father confronted Lane at the entrance to the girl's bathroom, and the two men had more than a few words. A witness said of the sex offender, the guy came running, sprinting out the front door with a very bloody nose. And I yes. saw if you if you look up the story, yeah, they fucked the guy up pretty bad. I think there was blood on his shirt, too. Good. Yeah, they really pounded Good. one. Another witness added that everyone was yelling, get him, get him. Don't let him get away. Another man who helped to restrain Lane was heard yelling at him. I'm going to tell you if that were my daughter, you wouldn't walk away. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, a group of fathers then followed Lane out of the restaurant and tackled him to the ground. It's safe to say that while some of his visible injuries occurred during the scuffle on the, on the asphalt outside the restaurant, witness reports suggested that what Lane was punched at least once before he ever made it outside. <laughs> but the band of resourceful dads wanted to ensure that the man faced more than street justice and so kept Lane pinned to the ground until police arrived. It was only then that they discovered Douglas Lane had been a registered registered sex offender in North Carolina since 2004 wow. when he was convicted of peeking into an un, an occupied restroom. Hmm. Uh, as the disturbing government records revealed, Lane's victims back then were eight and nine years old. This fuck it, douche canoe. Four years later, he was convicted of the same exact charge, though his victim was of age. Uh, meanwhile, South Carolina sex offender registry detailed even more of Lane's crimes, which included peeping, voyeurism, and, aggra- and aggravated voyeurism in 1997. I don't know what that would entail. Um, he also failed to register it as, as a sex offender in 1999. So, yeah, you just can't beat this thing out of people. Um, I have to give it to those guys for he's lucky he got away with his life. Yeah, and also like those the thing about being on the registry is that you're not allowed to go anywhere where children could be. So I mean, that that's probably a parole violation as well right there. Let's hope. Yeah. It's a giant canoe is what that guy is. Oh yeah. So right. he goes to jail. All right, so we're going to continue on the topic of hot temperatures because why not? <laughs> Another heat related crime. Eh? Yep. Uh, it's a five-year-old dies after being let. This is my favorite kind of story, and I mean that with all due sarcasm. Five-year-old dies after being left in a car during high temperatures for possibly up to several hours. Ugh. A five-year-old child died in Northern Virginia after being t- left in a car for what could have been several hours, officials said Tuesday. Officers responded to a report of an unconscious child in the neighborhood in Springfield, Virginia, at around 3.20 p.m. Tuesday, Fairfax County Police Department. Lieutenant John Lieb said during a news conference covered by WJLA, quote, officers arrived within minutes, found a small child that was unconscious, performed CPR. Members of the Fairfax Fire and Rescue personnel arrived shortly thereafter and transported the child to a local hospital. Tragically and sadly, the child was pronounced deceased at the hospital, end quote, Lieb said. He described the incident as a tragic accident. No, absolutely not. Nothing accidental about that. Uh, Lieb said the child and several other siblings were brought home by a parent while the other children left the car. The five-year-old stayed in the car, secured to a safety, a child safety seat, he said. The circumstances, God bless America, Rachel. The circumstances that led up to that child remaining in the child safety seat are still under investigation, he said. When asked about the length of time the child was left in the car, Lieb said, quote, that's part of the detective's investigation, a period of time up to a couple of hours at this point, very preliminarily. Detectives will remain open-minded and look at every angle of this case and determine the full facts and circumstances, end quote. Lieb also said that early information would suggest the child could have been in there for up to several hours, adding that summer heat likely played a factor in the death. Likely? No, fucking 100% played a factor in the death. You can't even leave. You you couldn't even have leave someone our age in there in in the summer and not have and not have us suffer. Exactly. We couldn't get liquids to drink. And no, we, we would suffer somehow. Yeah. Uh, it said temperatures hit the mid-90s in northern Virginia area on Tuesday afternoon. An autopsy will be conducted to confirm the cause and manner of death, Lieb said. Well, I'm going to tell you the manner of death was 
heat and how the hell do you several siblings and parents walk away from a five-year-old in a car seat in a hot car you could if you put a plate of food on the dash you could cook it in that heat oh yeah i remember i was supposed to do a video about that yeah you damn you guys are supposed to remind me yeah how to so, do that so you're putting a human being in this pressure cooker and it's essentially just, mm -hmm. just five years old you said he was five yep five yep so yeah that's uh there's nothing accidental about it that's just and that's negligent. a torturous way to go a torturous way to go oh yeah yeah totally and sit the kids, in, i mean i dare you to sit in your car for three three minutes is i mean max if i can do that in my car right now yeah it's like um well do you put those things in your windshield to like cast shade on the car when you're out i mean, need to but like i think i've mentioned before i have really dark tint on my windows oh, which yeah, helps a little bit um but yeah. even that it's just a flipping microwave well yeah in my, florida that would be a necessity for sure yeah yeah all right my next story is actually another it's a child neglect story to matt oh matt here we go <laughs> okay it's a different scenario but um so the headline is teen mom facing murder charge after falling asleep with 10 month old in bathtub. So, oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, this is in Georgia, actually. So, we're still in the South. Uh, okay. So, a 19 year old mother has been arrested in Georgia after falling asleep with her 10 month old child in a bathtub. Police claim Ainsley Nicole Brantley from Alamo uh, was on drugs when her infant son drowned on June 9th. You know, I was going to have her back for a minute, but you just ruined it. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> On June 9th, Coweta County Sheriff's Office responded to a 911 call about an unresponsive child. When they arrived, firefighters were already on the scene attempting to administer CPR. One firefighter told deputies they suctioned a lot of water from the child as he was being transported to Piedmont Newman High Hospital, where he was later pronounced dead. Uh, Brantley's mother and owner of the home, 36-year-old Kelly Gordon, told investigators on the scene she had gone shopping and returned to find her daughter and grandson were in the upstairs bathroom taking a bath. She said she tried to check on them through the door several times since she had been in the bathroom for some time, but only got mumbled responses that she couldn't understand, so she went back to watching TV. What? About 10 or 20 minutes later, she was startled by a scream from inside the bathroom. She found Brantley holding the baby, saying, he can't breathe. What do I do? Gordon said she took her grandson and began resuscitating him, telling investigators she saw how blue he was and he was cold, real cold. According to the police report, the deputy then went to speak with Brantley, who was sitting in a chair with only a towel wrapped around her, crying, and not in a state where she was willing to speak. After executing a search warrant, police said they found methamphetamine at the home. They believe Brantley took some before getting into the bath with her son. She was arrested on second-degree felony murder and second-degree child cruelty charges. Gordon, meanwhile, was arrested and charged with possession of narcotics. The Noonan uh, Times-Herald reported her five other children were also taken from her and placed in the care of the Georgia Department of Family and Children's Services. Brantley was denied bond and remains in custody. Her mother is also still in custody on other charges, unrelated to either the drugs or the death of her grandson. The 19-year-old has five other children? Something like that. Yeah, I think, uh, let me see. That's her the way five, I heard yeah, it. Her five other children, that's right. Jesus 19, Christ. You know what? I actually met a girl once who was 19, had four children. So, I mean, it's that's not like it's impossible if, if they're that reckless. and. That's too many damn kids. Yeah, I guess, you know, enough uh, early uh, adolescent sexual encounters that'll add up, sure. Well, I also think with the grandmother, 20 minutes that she went watching TV, could that have saved her grandson's life? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It sounds like the whole fucking family's fucked messed up. up, you know. Messed up. <laughs> yeah, messed up, yeah. You know, these... But um, also, I think, isn't meth a it's a stimulant so how are you falling asleep i mean that's more of yeah that yeah. falling asleep is more of an opiate heroin situation so never, that's I've interesting done, to me that you're I've falling asleep done, yeah i've never done meth i never will do meth but what i understand about it 
is that it right. makes you wired. So obviously, but I don't know, maybe maybe you crash. I don't know if that's something. Yeah, that could be it, I guess. Yeah, I've watched uh, every single episode of um, Intervention, so I'm a, I'm a specialist. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, think, well, I think that's why people end up like, getting addicted to it, because like when you come down from the high, you're you just, just crash. Like, you're tired, you're, you can't function. And so I think it's the same with cocaine. They have to do more cocaine to get through the day. And, then, and that's where you get the addiction. So maybe that's what happened. That's probably that's probably likely. That seems yeah. likely. And also, shitty parenting can be cyclical. Uh, it can be passed down sometimes. Well, I was gonna say at the beginning before I heard that you had been using drugs. I mean, I get that feeling of being so tired that you could fall asleep. You know? Oh yeah. When yeah. the babies are little. But I was gonna say, I mean, when I became when I t- was a mother. It doesn't matter what you're doing, especially if they're in the bathtub. You do not leave. You are so very aware of what they're doing. And I don't care how flipping tired you are. You're not falling asleep with the baby in the bath. That's just, it doesn't happen. Just like if you're, you know, I go days without sleep, baby wakes up next to you, needs to eat, you're up. It's just, it's a natural innate instinct. So if you don't have that, it's because you're altering, you're probably under, um, you know, substance abuse altering dr- uh, something because a good mother would have a, a natural instinct to yeah well i mean well drug addicts rear the children yeah. drug addicts are very selfish people so yep. ultimately they're not in the habit of putting others before themselves so yeah exactly yeah and before we go on before we go into your next story yes. i just want to mention actually a plug because one thing that we have in, in development is a new podcast, and it is going to be called Children of the Void. Rachel is going to be a co-host, and Michelle Gower, who was on the last True Crime News, will be the other host. Uh, I'll be producing it, but I won't be uh, one of the hosts. So what it consists of is it's, it's all about child abuse cases and mm-hmm. missing children. The Void refers to, well, three different things. Uh, children, you know, the, the death of a child, death being the void, uh, and then when it comes to missing children, that that refers to like, you know, the lack of information, not knowing if they're alive or dead, not knowing where they've been taken. And then the, the other void uh, refers to like the, the isolation of abuse, like an mm. example, like Lauren Kavanaugh being kept in that closet for six years yep. hit from the world. And that's how abuse is. The number one tool of abusers is isolation so they can do it and hide it from others. So uh, we'll keep you guys uh, posted on how that's coming along, but that's going to come your way soon. I'm excited. I really got along with her. And for everyone who's not Rachel centric on the pod, then maybe <laughs> skip past this series. But um, us being both being mothers, I think this is a um, it'll be really interesting for us to we got along brilliantly right off the bat. So I really okay. we, our personalities vibed and I'm excited to to do it. I'm excited for, to do something with her. So I'm Yay. excited about it. Too. I mean, I mean <laughs> as, as disturbed as people are by the children's stories, they want to listen to them. They I know. Them, so. All right. So what's your next story? <laughs> well, let's just keep on the <laughs> theme, shall we? Uh, so this is kind of a big story. I saw it on a bunch of our sites, some of my sites that I visit for, for new true crime news. Um, but Matthew Coleman's wife, so Matthew Coleman is the the man's name, told cops he wouldn't hurt kids before he allegedly killed them with a spear gun. Oh. Are you guys ready? You ready for this? Are you ready? <laughs> oh, it's just, uh, it's a doozy. Okay. Matthew Taylor Coleman and his family were packing for a camping trip on August 7th when authorities allege he abruptly put his two kids in his van and drove off, leaving his wife, Abby, wondering what happened. According to charging documents obtained by People, Abby began texting her husband, but the messages were not going through. She became even more worried when she realized Matthew had driven away from the couple's Santa Barbara, California home without car seats for the kids. And I do just want to put this out there. There are several sources. I went with the people, mostly from the People article, just because it was longer and a little more detailed. But this is legitimate, everything that was said here. So you're not... You'll you'll see why later. <laughs> and by the way, guys, 
when she says people, she means people magazine, not just people. People, <laughs> not yeah. just actual people. Yeah. yeah. It's a, they have a pretty good crime. They do. Uh, yeah. yeah. So concerned Abby called police. According to the FBI's report, Abby told authorities she didn't believe her husband would hurt the children. Kaleo, two, and Roxy, 10 months old. Authorities tracked Matthew Coleman's iPhone and saw that it had recently been in Rosarito, Mexico, a city about 20 miles south of the border in the Mexican state of Baja, California. A case was, the case was handed over to the FBI. Even as she waited for answers, Abby told authorities that she and her husband hadn't been arguing and that there was no marital strife. She, re she reiterated to authorities that she did not believe that the children were in any danger and she believed Coleman would eventually return home with the kids. But Abby never saw her children again. Police say Coleman, a 40-year-old surfing instructor, drove the children into Mexico on August 7th. They checked into a hotel. Investigators allege that Coleman took them to a ranch in Mexico early on the Monday morning of, I'm sorry, early on the morning of August 9th. There, they say he killed them with a spear fishing gun and returned to his hotel a few hours later. He was arrested when he attempted to cross the border back into the United States. According to the charging documents, Coleman allegedly told police he was motivated by the QAnon conspiracy theory, which holds the false, false belief that former President Donald Trump had secretly been battling a cable of Satan worshiping pedophiles at the highest levels of the political power and influence. This oh, is a better. legitimate thing, and I am not making this up, so y'all go do your own research, okay? I am not. Uh, this isn't bullshit. This, was, uh, this wasn't just on people. This was all over the place. I saw it, yeah. People obtained a criminal complaint that was filed in the U.S. District Court last Wednesday. In the 10-page complaint, FBI Special Agent Jennifer Bannon wrote that Coleman claimed to be, quote, enlightened by QAnon and the Illuminati conspiracy theories and was receiving visions and signs revealing that his wife, A.C., possessed serpent DNA and had passed it on to his children, end quote. Yeah. Quote, M. Coleman stated that he believed his own children were going to grow into monsters, so he had to kill them, Bannon wrote. Coleman allegedly told Bannon that he knew his actions were wrong, but that killing the children was the only way to save the world. Coleman is being held without bond. He has not yet entered a plea, and a public defender who represented him in his first court hearing has not returned people's calls for comment. According to family members, the children's death have devastated Abby. Friends and family members have set up a GoFundMe to help Abby deal with her sudden loss. Quote, Abby and her family are loved so deeply and have touched so many of our lives in such a powerful way. The family wrote on the GoFundMe, we appreciate your kindness and help during this difficult time. Damn. So that sounds like he must be like schizophrenic or have some kind of delusional uh, mental illness or something. I well, mean, there's a, a lot. It, it's an interest. You can there's a couple of web series that actually go into the QAnon conspiracies. And oh, yeah, yeah. the people who get deep into them and it is really intense yeah. intense like it's yeah. just scary that if you get trapped into a certain part of the internet that you can get brainwashed it's easy for some people to get brainwashed and to believe you know what they're that's why you know fact fact checking and all that kind of stuff is important because you have people that go off a deep end and then kill their effing children because they believe in what they're reading it's just insanity but uh, you can't splice animal dna with human dna i mean God. richard chase tried injecting rabbit blood and he got violently ill <laughs> so there you go yep so well, i thought that was interesting yeah well actually he was crazy enough to believe in that kind of shit so yeah anyway, they're out there my next one this is a very interesting murder story you don't hear about these every day North Dakota man tries to sever girlfriend's head with a yo-yo. Holy so, shit. Okay. On Tuesday morning, I, I think this was a recent story, Derek Dillman, 32, asked Michelle Kilstrom for a ride to the police station to hand himself in on outstanding warrants related to driving on a suspended license and fleeing from police from the previous year. She agreed. But according to a probable cause affidavit obtained by law and crime, Dillman changed his mind en route. He began kicking the dash 
and windshield and started making threatening comments, telling her twice, I'm going to fucking kill you. Hmm. As they got nearer the police station, Kilstrom said he became even more agitated, making her fear for her life and causing her to run red lights in order to get to the station as fast as she could. Michelle stated after she ran the red light, Derek wrapped her yo-yo string around Michelle's neck and cinched the string in an attempt to kill her as she was turning into the parking lot at the police department. After getting safely inside, she told officers her boyfriend of two years had modified the yo-yo string to be used as a garret as, quote, he believes the string can slice off a human head. Probably not. Wow. Uh, Luckily for her, the string broke and she was able to flee into the safety of the police building. Officers observed an injury around her entire neck, consistent with a string or wire. Dillman was then observed on police security camera, fleeing the parking lot in the car while he was still suspended from driving. Around 2.30 that day, another officer spotted Dillman riding a mini bike and attempted to pull him over on that, activating his lights and ordering him to stop. Uh, the officer said Dillman acknowledged the commands but replied, I have to get to the Capitol before attempting to flee. He was okay. eventually caught and arrested at the North Dakota State Capitol grounds. More mental sanity here. This is just oh, oh, mentally yeah. stable people. Mm-hmm. So he was charged with attempted murder, aggravated assault, terrorizing an adult victim, fleeing a police officer from a felony offense, and attempting to provide false information to law enforcement. And driving uh, on a suspended license. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, strangulation, did you listen to the um, the latest episode, the uh, the Randy the, Crack episode? Yes, I sure did. How, how do you like them apples? Um, I don't like them at all. Thanks. That's quite the, a block count, eh? Holy shit, man! This trio of people has. <sighs> yeah, and, and all at the same time. Th- all three of those guys. Patrick, oh, they were going on at the same time, really? Yeah, well, roughly at the same time. But Jesus. Yeah, the same, yeah, from the 70s into the 80s. William hey, don't hitch- hitchhiking in the 70s was a bad, bad thing, man. <laughs> Especially in California. Folks. No shit. God, that was crazy. I forgot about that. We should have talked about that at the beginning. We're off, like I said. Oh, it totally, yeah. Yeah, uh, I listened to that earlier this week, though. Um, yeah, what's your next story? Uh, let's see. Okay, so we're going to switch it up here. Uh, Florida, go to Florida. And Altamont Springs. And the headline is, um, if this isn't a Florida of the Times headline, toddler in Florida allegedly fatally shoots mother on a Zoom call. Huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, obviously not Zoom, but yeah. Yeah, she was on a Zoom call. Yeah. So a 21-year-old woman was reportedly shot and killed August 11th during a Zoom call after her toddler found a loaded shot or handgun, not shotgun. He couldn't hold a shotgun. According to the Altamont Springs Police Department, Shamaya Lynn was on a conference call Wednesday when one of the attendees, quote, saw a toddler in the background and heard a noise. Altamont Police said Lynn fell backward and never returned to the call. One of the attendees called 911 and paramedics and officers went to Lynn's residence on Spanish Trace Drive. The Altamont Police Department wrote in their statement that first responders did their best in rendering aid to Miss Lynn, but she was found with a fatal gunshot wound to the head. <clears throat> Upon further investigation, officers reportedly determined that Lynn's toddler discovered the gun, which police say was left unsecured by an adult in the apartment. WESH-TV released part of the 911 call from the Zoom participant. According to WESH, the woman said to the dispatch, quote, we heard a loud kaboom, and then she leaned back, and we just saw blood from her face. God, that would be really traumatizing. Yeah. Uh, The caller reportedly added, the baby's back there crying. She's not answering or anything. We're calling her name. She's not responding. Um, According to WKMG-TV, another toddler was also at home at the time of the shooting. Authorities reportedly believe the gun belongs to the child's father, the children's father. Altamont Springs Police said in their statement they are working with the Seminole County State Attorney's Office to determine charges for the gun owner. Yeah, totally. And I'm thinking 
the kid who pulled the trigger, it's not their fault, but um, I think they're probably going to go through life. I mean, yeah, eventually they're going to find out what happened and they're going to blame themselves. Oh, yeah. That, there's a lot of mental trauma that's going to happen there. And, and then maybe also blame the father for leaving the firearm in their range uh, being a toddler. Yeah, because as damaging as it is to grow up without a father, it not having the mother around during early childhood is actually much worse. And uh, so that that's going to be a big, big issue for that kid. Absolutely. Up. So sad. So sad and preventable. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You got to hide. You got to hide the gun. You can't just leave it around. It's not a toy. That is not. No. All right. My next one. Uh, this is apropos for this week because I'm developing an episode about a woman who murdered her husband, Catherine Knight. Ah, I'm excited about that one. And that's what this story is about, not her. <gasps> so the headline is the husband asks for divorce. Wife runs him over and kills him in an ATV, all-terrain vehicle. Uh, so police in Oklahoma said an argument over food ended, <laughs> with, ended with Christopher Lewis dead and 35-year-old Chanel Lewis charged with his murder. It's funny, that name, like, it sounds like it'd be some kind of fashionista, but she's actually this, like, really ugly hag. She's a totally inappropriate name. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, the couple were cr- camping with their children at Soggy Bottoms ATV Trails when the fight broke out, according to the, the sheriff's office. He had told her he wanted a divorce, and she made a statement that she was going to run him over and kill him, which is exactly what she then did using his own ATV, according to investigators. The 911 call made by a staff member at the campground and obtained by the broadcaster. Here's a panicked caller telling the dispatcher that little girl was screaming, saying her dad was dead. Somebody ran her dead over her dad over and mm-hmm. said he was dead out on one of our trails. The victim's 20-year-old son, Christian Cornette, claimed his stepmother then tried to run him and his teenage sister over. So he punched her in the face. Sometimes it's okay to hit a woman under extreme circumstances, Uh, the results of which are clearly evident in her mugshot. Lewis was originally charged with manslaughter, but after further investigation, the charges were upgraded to second-degree murder. Uh, The undersheriff said, first one that we've ever had where somebody intentionally ran somebody over. He added there was some alcohol involved. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, like, no guff. Uh, the medical examiner has not yet confirmed what fatal injuries the victim suffered. His grieving son told the outlet his father was a much-loved off-roading and mega-truck enthusiast. And his, his son said he was a great man and would help anyone in need. I have a thousand brothers because he was a father figure to everyone. Have you well, ever... You ever read an ATV? Oh my god, I grew up on an ATV. So if you get hit by, that's gonna fuck you up. Oh yeah. Um, my very first boyfriend actually, we got into an ATV accident. I was 19. Um, we were trail, we were on trails, and drunk people in ATVs, there's gonna be shit. Oh yeah. Accidents are gonna happen for sure. But another couple on an ATV came around the corner and. Um, t-boned us so they hit us right in the middle of where our legs are down on the side of the atv i happened to luckily and thankfully kind of fall back so my i lifted my legs up and his was crushed he ended up having an external halo around his leg for six months like um metal bars had to be put into his leg and bolts and screws and all kinds of stuff which actually ended up probably eventually leading to his death because he got addicted to oxycontin and oh really yeah yeah, that was years later but yeah you can get in some trouble i've fallen off a couple atvs (laughs) for sure well how fat what's the maximum speed of those things well, I mean, we he had a couple of racing ones. So his racing ones, I mean, we could go up to 50, 60 miles an hour on flat, open terrain, and we would haul ass. And then the big, chunkier ones are just, they're heavy. So even if you're going, you know, 15, 20 miles an hour, that's a, it's a big machine. It can, t- it can run you over for sure. Yeah. And we're running over stumps and trees and stuff on those. We're taking out trees. Well, 
Well, if you're, you're driving at 60 miles an hour up to someone and your intent is to run them over, yeah, I guess. That, yeah, you have to be really, really careful. I mean, that's the top speed. It's, you have to, we're on flat terrain when we're, when we were, we were doing those kind of things, but it was still, it was ter. I was scared. I was a little scared. Sure, though. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially if I'm not in control. I don't like being on the back of, I like to be in control of things, not. On the back. Yeah, yeah, but he, the guy has to drive, right? No, hell no. I'll take I'll take over. <laughs> okay. Um. By the way, Catherine Knight is one of my absolute favorite favorite stories in true crime. Oh, I'm yeah. fucking pumped to hear you tell this story. I've so, never been this excited. So I made the trailer and I put a photo that I've been informed is not her. Have you seen the trailer? I didn't. I didn't watch the trailer. No. Oh, because um. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I put her name into Google Images, and uh-huh. it, there's a bunch of pictures of her from when she's young, and then a picture from prison. But people in, in the YouTube comments say that it's actually a picture of some Russian woman. Oh, okay. So, well, it doesn't matter. I, the story is still fan. Now, if you guys don't know the story of Catherine Knight, please don't Google it. Listen, to, wait for Morgan's pod because it's my favorite by far. Well, it's in, well, it's an interesting story in that you see signs of. The person she eventually became from a ver- very early on in life. Oh, just wait! I'm yeah. so excited. Well, oh, she's in our she's in my serial killer killer coloring book, I think. She is, eh? I think well, she is. Well, I mean, if that picture is her, like basically, she still has red hair, but her face is just, you know, weathered. But, yeah. Uh, well, maybe, she was uh, a she was a hard woman. <laughs> well, yeah, to say the least. <laughs> to say the least. Oh yeah, yeah. She reminds me. She's like kind of um, Warnos, Warnos-ish. Yeah, in her, well, like a little bit. Yeah, it has has to do with her childhood, which is yeah, weird. bad. All of it's bad. It's all bad. Yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> but I'm excited. What's your next story? Okay, so let's lighten it up. Pennsylvania man arrested arrested after human head found in his freezer and a body in his bed. <laughs> Just kidding. We're on true crime news. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. A 32-year-old man was arrested Wednesday after officers responded to his home and found a human head in his freezer and a body in the bedroom. According to the Lancaster Bureau of Police at 8.51 a.m. on August 11th, officers responded to the residence on the 200 block of West Strawberry Street for a welfare check on family members. The person who called police was one of the residents, Daniel Meshi Jr., He told her there was a cadaver in one of the beds in the home and there was a head in the freezer. That was a quote. When police arrived, Meshi Jr. reportedly took the officer into the kitchen and removed what appeared to be a human head from the freezer. The statement says, according to WGAL-TV, it was allegedly placed on a white dinner plate. (laughs) Speaking of Catherine Knight. It's a poor name. (laughs) The Lancaster County Coroner's Office later confirmed it was a human head. Meshi Jr. spoke with officers at the Lancaster City Police Station about the scene at his residence. According to the statement, Meshi Jr. reportedly said he discovered a, quote, cadaver doll, end quote, in his father's bedroom. He allegedly said it looked and sounded like his father. Lancaster Bureau of Police wrote Meshi Jr. said he, quote, admitted to stabbing the cadaver doll, for two to three minutes with a knife and then dismembered the body, end quote. Meshi Jr. was arrested on charges of criminal homicide, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with or fabricating physical evidence. According to WGAL, the victim was identified as Donald Meshi Sr. Citing court documents reports Meshi allegedly used a handsaw to dismember the body. He then allegedly placed the arms, legs, and head in garbage cans and put I'm sorry, his ar- the arms, legs, and torso in garbage cans and put the head in the freezer Wednesday. The torso was then put into a foot locker and taken outside to into a car. Court records show Meshi was booked into the Lancaster County Jail and was denied bail. Oh yeah, wow. That just happened. Damn, that's like a that's like a so new he bummer. he said he. He called his father a cadaver doll. Cadaver doll. Wow. Well. He said his father was a cadaver doll. 
he did and then a dismembered his body. He did a Dahmer, yeah. So he's going to be going to prison for a long time. Yeah. Mental uh, instability. Uh, right. My next story, uh, the headline is Louisiana dead, uh, Louisiana dad rather shot dead by 17 year old boy he caught climbing into teen daughter's bedroom. Oof. Um, but well, the guy who climbed into her bedroom was actually her boyfriend. He didn't approve of her. Um, so Desmond Hamilton, 34 died of multiple gunshot wounds at his home in Zachary, Louisiana, around 8 a.m. Monday morning after catching 17-year-old Nicholas McWhorter climbing in through the 14-year-old's window. Zachary PD initially said the incident was reported as a break-in, but it soon emerged all involved were familiar with each other. According to the police chief, the suspect had used a ladder to gain access to his younger girlfriend's bedroom, something he had done before. The suspect had a ladder, got into the second story window to see the homeowner, Desmond Hamilton's 14-year-old daughter. He said the father disapproved of his daughter's relationship and had had run-ins with the boy before. Um, other instances, I'm learning that when they lived at a prior place in an apartment complex, he used a ladder to get in there. So this has been an ongoing issue. He was hoping to stop it, but it continued. Said an argument broke out, which escalated into a gunfight. Desmond brought him downstairs and began talking to him. An argument ensued that began getting in onto the 14-year-old. As they were getting onto the 14-year-old, shots were fired. McWhorter was wounded and taken to hospital. Hamilton died on the scene. It is unclear who fired first. Upon his release from hospital, police say they will charge the teenager with second-degree murder, illegal mm. use of a weapon, and illegal possession of a stolen firearm. Uh, Hamilton was an entrepreneur who ran a number of local businesses and was spoken of very highly among neighbors. He was in the process of building a snowball stand as a gift to the community, now left half completed. It starts at home, Chief, McDavid added. These young kids got to learn respect, how to treat people, and how to deal with conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but also, I mean, that whole situation is tragic. That's super tragic just because, well, the girl's 14. She's super young. So I get the anger from dad because I'd be angry as well. But, yeah. you know, calmer, wiser heads need to prevail in this situation. And yes, while you're angry, you know, brandishing firearms at a 17 year old is also not the way to go. He should not have had a firearm because he's 17 years old. So that's a problem. And that just all escalated very quickly and could have been de-escalated with, you know, smarter, wiser heads being the adult in that situation prevailing. And then girl is going to be another kid who's going to yeah. live with the death of a parent yep. uh, from an early age, you know, and may, may partially blame herself because mm -hmm. she let the guy come over. So, There's a lot of lives ruined in that situation. Totally, yeah. All right, what's your next story? <clears throat> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I swear to God I don't do this on purpose. I really had a hard time finding stories this week. Um, Ohio woman pleads guilty to murder for dragging her son with car as she sped away. Mm. I, next week I'll try to do n no children death stories. How about you that? You said she dragged her son? Oh, wow. With a car. Here we go. <laughs> okay. James Hutchinson died on February 27th as his mother, Brittany Gosney, was attempting to abandon him and his seven-year-old siblings after hog tying them in a park and driving off. An Ohio mother is accused of killing her son by dragging him with her car as the boy clung to the door, desperate not to be abandoned with his siblings in a park. Brittany Gosney opted to take a murder plea this week after she was deemed suitable to stand trial. James Hutchinson, six, died on February 27th as his mother, 29-year-old Brittany Gosney, was attempting to abandon him and his seven, him and, his seven and nine-year-old siblings after hogtying them in Rush Run Park in Preble County. According to an incident report from the Preble County Sheriff's Office, her youngest child, James, latched onto his mother's car door handle as she sped away. Oh, that's sad. <clears throat> Very sad. Quote, Brittany slammed the gas trying to leave the kids and drug Hutchinson, possibly running him over. 
the probable cause statement indicts. Brittany turned the vehicle around to check on Hutchinson and he was dead. On Monday, Gosney accepted the murder plea in two counts of endangering children. Butler County Court records show. The arrest report states that Gosney returned to the park within an hour and found her son's dead body, which she loaded into her vehicle and drove to the home of her boyfriend, James Hamilton, around 3 a.m. the following morning. They allegedly dumped the boy's body in the Ohio River. The two had apparently spoken about getting rid of her children. Hours later, Gosney and Hamilton went to the police to report her son missing. After reportedly giving conflicting, giving conflicting reports, both alleg allegedly confessed to having disposed of James' body, and accord uh, according to the arrest report. Gosney and Hamilton were subsequently indicted on multiple criminal charges, including murder, tampering with evidence, five counts of abuse of a corpse, kidnapping, and child endangerment, according to the court records in Butler County. In court on Monday, Assistant Prosecutor Kelly Heal reportedly said that Gosley's guilty plea will spare her surviving children the further trauma that a trial could have brought them or could potentially bring them. Quote, we have two living children that have lived through trauma that no other children should have to experience, the Journal News reported. Lewis Hutchinson, James Hutchinson's father, reportedly told local station WCMH after his son's murder, murder that he'd happily take his son into his home. All she had to do was give him to me. She could have dropped him off at my sister's house. The station reported, he said. Butler County Children's Services has taken custody of Gosney's two surviving children. Hamilton is scheduled for a hearing on August 23rd. He has been accused of abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence. In March, David Washington, an attorney representing Gosney, filed a motion to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, according to court records. Defendant struggles to assist in her defense and counsel and has serious concerns regarding defendant's mental health, David Washington wrote. In May, the register reported that Gosney had seen a court-appointed psychologist who said that she'd faced a number of barriers in trying to give up custody of her three children. So she was trying to actively give them up, and the courts wouldn't let her. Court documents show that Gosney told authorities she was removed from her father's home at the age of 12 by the Hamilton County Department of Job and Family Services because she was the victim of repeated sexual abuse. She said she'd given birth to her first child at the age of 12. The psychologist overseeing her case reportedly said that Gosney does pre present with an underlying personality disorder marked by antisocial features, but was ultimately deemed competent to stand trial. Gosney sentencing is scheduled for September 13th. You know, I wonder um, how many, how often this situation arises with like children and family services and the, and the courts where there's these parents like her, they just don't want their kids anymore and they're trying to like unload them on, you know, the, the system. Probably wonder, a lot more than we'd like to know. Yeah, like uh, they're probably just, yeah, there probably are people just said, I don't want to raise them. I don't want kids in my life and and it's hard to to i can imagine it's something maybe we should cover on our, our our pod me and michelle um i imagine it's a lot harder than you think to give up your kids once you've had your kids if you have a newborn baby you have safe places where you can take a newborn baby but, but you can't get rid of you can't just give up kids they're not going to let you do that man but if you're a complete narcissist yeah you're gonna you'll you'll probably do whatever it takes i guess but i mean even but I mean, if you do have the option of taking them to your to the to the other parent, yeah, I mean, Jesus, at least wonder, try. Maybe maybe there was uh, maybe there was bad blood between them. I don't know. But um, I mean, if she was trying to weaponize her kids yeah. against him, that's something I'm very much against. I think that's yep. uh, reprehensible. Absolutely. Using the kids against each other. Um, I mean, this is, woman's just a fuck up. But I mean, sadly. If you do attempt to unload the children on the system, that that is a red flag. So mm -hmm. maybe it does work to an extent, but I guess maybe they try to. Talk well, and then the system failed too, because if yeah, yeah, if there's you know, um, she faced a number of barriers, quote that was in quotes, and trying to give up custody for three children, then somebody should have been aware of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I don't know, just shit might, all around. My last story is a it's a long one and it's a Florida story. So okay. I, sure. Um, let me see. So, so here's the headline: 
Satanic drawings found in the notebook of teen accused of stabbing cheerleader 114 times. Holy shit. So Satan has a, a summer home in Florida, I guess. Oh, duh. Yeah. It's hot, so, as, it's hot as his balls here yeah, right now. So his ass crack is sitting on right on top of us. Yeah, he likes the climate, right? So, yeah, of course. Uh, so so home. Grizzly new details have emerged in the horrific murder of 13-year-old cheerleader Tristan Bailey, who was found stabbed 114 times in Florida on Mother's Day. Oh, what great timing. Oh, my God, that's uh, horrific. I didn't know there were 13-year-old cheerleaders, but all right. I was a 13-year-old cheerleader. Oh, you were a cheerleader? that? Oh, I thought it was only, like, uh, high school. No, I, we did Pop Warner. I was, like, oh, yeah. 10 when I started, I think. According to new documents released by the 7th Judicial State's Attorney's Office, when police put Aiden Fucci, the 14-year-old, accused of killing Bailey, into an interrogation room and told him Bailey's body had been found and he was the last to have seen her, he responded, how is that my problem? Oh, my fu- – okay, you know what? <laughs> I'm done. I'm done with humanity. I'm, I can't deal with this shit. Investigators also found bloody clothes and sneakers in Fuji's bedroom, but also a notebook containing, quote, drawings of the of a violent nature, with one depicting a satanic element to them to include a pentagram. Another illustration showed a naked female with red X's over her breasts and genitals and blood spurting out from severed arms. Uh, the document also claimed friends of Fuji said he was vocal about wanting to murder someone. If he were to kill someone, it was going to be planned. He would find a random person walking at night, drag them into the woods, and stab them, a friend told detectives. Fuji's girlfriend also told police he would sneak up behind her and pretend to slit her throat with his knives. Okay. Which he, nick- which he nicknamed, he nicknamed the knives Picker and Poker. Oh, my God. Uh, Aiden knew something was wrong with him and wanted to reach out for help, a friend reportedly said to authorities. Prosecutors have decided to charge Aiden Fucci, the 14-year-old Florida teen accused of killing 13-year-old Tristan Bailey, as an adult. His charge was also upped to first-degree murder on Thursday. During a press conference, State Attorney R.K. Lariza told reporters Fucci told his friends, quote, he intended to kill someone and indicated to witnesses that he was going to kill someone by taking them in the woods and stabbing them. Hmm. Larissa all added that Fucci didn't say who that was and pointed out how that statement fit the facts of the case. It brings me no pleasure to be charging a 14-year-old as an adult with first-degree murder, but I can tell you also the executive team and I reviewed all the facts, all the circumstances, the applicable law, and it was not a difficult decision to make that he should be charged as an adult. Grizzly new details also emerged in the case as Larissa revealed Bailey was stabbed 114 times with 49 defensive stab wounds to the hands, arms, and head. The tip of the blade broke off and was located by the medical examiner in the scalp of our victim. To say that it was horrific could arguably be made as an understatement. Bottom line, Premeditation can be inferred, certainly just from the sheer number of stab wounds that Tristan Bailey had to suffer. Fucci hasn't entered a plea, but the sheriff's office uh, previously said he changed his story several times during interviews after his arrest and made several admissions at the time. A 14-year-old posted a selfie from the back of a squad car. I hate him. Mocking the teen cheerleader he is suspected of killing. On Monday, Aiden Fucci was arrested and charged with a second-degree murder of 13-year-old Tristan Bailey, who was found stabbed to death in a remote wooded area of St. John's, Florida, the night before. Is that anywhere near you? I don't know where St. John's is. I was just going to say, no, I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like I guess that's a rural area. Um, After being taken into custody, the teenager allegedly posted a photo of his reflection in the police car to Snapchat, flashing a peace sign with the caption, Hey, guys, has anybody seen Tristan lately? Uh, According to St. John's County Sheriff's Office, they received a missing persons call at 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Bailey's family told detectives they had not seen her since midnight Saturday. Police immediately issued a missing persons report asking for public assistance in locating her. 
telling local residents she was last seen wearing a white cheerleading skirt and a dark colored shirt. But by 6 p.m. Sunday, the worst was confirmed. A body was located in the woods by a volunteer and identified. Uh, according to the arrest report obtained by First Coast News, the deputies discovered security footage that showed two teens walking together at around 1.45 a.m. Sunday morning. Later footage showed one person walking alone shortly before 3.30 a.m. holding a pair of shoes. The report states that while being interviewed in the presence of his mother, she mentioned something about the video depicting him carrying his shoes, to which Fucci replied, his feet hurt. Um, after obtaining a warrant, investigators said that among the evidence they found was an outfit that matched the one the suspect was wearing in the video. They also said some of the items seized tested positive for the presence of blood. According to the sheriff's office, Fucci changed his story several times during interviews and made several admissions. Um, Sheriff Rod Hard Rob Hardwick <laughs> almost said Rod Hardwick. Rob, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Freudian slip there. Uh, Rob <laughs> Hardwick told WOKV the cop car selfie will be used against him in court. Okay. Uh, he said, uh, I know it looks egregious with him making those statements in that car, but that is now evidence that we gather and use against him. So that just makes our case a better case to present to the state attorney's office and to present to a jury down the road saying this was his mindset. This is what he's doing. Was he proud? Was he proud of what he did? So, you know, this is going to help our case and make it stronger to, you know, his intentions. On Tuesday, SJSO said a number of other people were trying to gain fame and followers by pretending to have knowledge of the crime and posting inflammatory things to social media. Uh, and they said, uh, first, we want to thank each of you for your continued efforts by sending in tips to us. We have gained valuable information and look into everything that's being sent. There are a number of accounts, however, that are using this case to try to gain fame and followers. Please know that these individuals had nothing to do with this incident. At this time, the below accounts have already been investigated and no longer need to be forwarded to the sheriff's office. They added, use, listing a number of Instagram user names they had determined to be fakers. Oh, that's good that they did that. So there are, uh, yeah, there's true crime trolls that do things like that, and mm -hmm. I don't condone that. That uh, it's harmful for the the families of the victims and so. prosecutors and detectives and people trying to work the case. So don't be a fucking douche canoe and do that. Thanks. Have a nice day. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not in the mood for your shit today. If you're not going to be helpful, then don't do that. Just get a life. Yeah. And St. John's, by the way, is just south of Jacksonville, so it's almost it's upper. Um, uh, north, south, east, uh, upper east, uh, northeast, like almost to Georgia. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's very, really very, cool. yeah, but close to the ocean. Oh, uh, okay. How, how long, a how long a drive is that from where you are? <sighs> Probably five and a half hours or so. Oh, uh, okay. So you don't hear any screams at night or anything? <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, uh, that's or... a little bit too far for me right now. Um, yeah, that's really shitty. That kid is a psychopath, and I hope he gets sentenced harshly. Well, well when I saw his picture, I, he kind of reminded me of Dylan Roof, like the, you would normally expect a kid looking like him to be responsible for such a horrific crime. But then again, I don't know, I guess people tend to judge a book by its cover. They always assume these people are going to be really creepy looking, mm -hmm. and it's rarely true. Yeah, yeah, he well, God, something's wrong with him. Oh, for sure. All uh, right. Uh, what, my last story. last story. Um, so my last story for anybody that is into video games should know about this because I have a couple people in my social media circle that are pretty into game. I used to love gaming before I was uh, had children. I kind of miss it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah well I just don't have that you have you need a lot of time to put into the games I used to play and I just don't have that time anymore unfortunately but oh yeah yeah um so there was a man arrested in the connection of the murder of um a famous voice actress Christiani Lewis uh she's a Brazilian voice actor 
the over uh, known for her over voiceover of Mercy and Overwatch. So um, the Overwatch community has been devastated over the number of Christiani over, over the murder of Christiani Lewis, a Brazilian voice actor who is known known as her role as Mercy. Overwatch fans found out about the 49-year-old's death on August 6th when fellow voice actor Mario Tupinambo Filho, sorry if I say that uh, incorrectly, <laughs> revealed the sad news on Instagram. He said he would love her forever in a heartbreaking caption on the social media platform. Now, a man has been arrested for Luis's murder, and it may have been someone th the Mercy actress knew. Let me take a breath before I say this guy's name. <sighs> Pedro Paulo Goncalves Vasconcelos de Costa, 27, was arrested on August 13th by Brazilian homicide detectives. He was accused of murdering Lewis on July 22nd when she was stabbed multiple times in her apartment. According to Brazilian news reports, Luis had been letting Paulo, thank God for not using his entire name for the rest of the story, live with her for a few weeks. Luis and Paolo had met in a psychiatric clinic and became friends. During an alleged mental, during an alleged mental crisis, Luis had let Paolo stay with her. Paolo initially told police that the murder was an act of self-defense, but police believe Paolo was after Luis's possessions. He had stolen a few of Luis's personal items, including a computer and multiple phones. With help from his mother, Paolo hid Luis's body for two days as they continued to live out their lives as normal. This was revere, revealed after Paolo attempted to tell lead investigator Leandro Costa that he hadn't talked to the victim since June 17th. Paolo claimed that Luis uh, had traveled to Mangratabid, Mangratiba with her boyfriend and would be gone for 15 days. This story didn't seem to hold any weight with the police who later arrested Paolo and got the full story. Paolo's mother, oh God, these names, Iliani Goncalves Vasconcelos de Costa is still at large. Luisa has been, has a, I'm sorry, has been a beloved voice actor since 1994. Her long career has included voicing Mercy in Overwatch, Cortana in Halo, Severe in League of Legends, and Bayonetta. Her voice has also been heard in The Simpsons, Everybody Hates Chris, and The League of Justice Without Limits. With such a long and impressive history in the gaming industry, the community has continued to make tributes for Louisa and share their favorite memories of Louisa's career. Twitter and Facebook have overflowed with fans saying, quote, heroes never never die in Louisa's honor. Hmm. Oh, that's too bad. Mm-hmm. It's funny, I just sent, a, sent off a demo reel to a bunch of voiceover agencies. Yes! See, I was feeling your vibe. Yeah, yeah, so well, hopefully they're not they're not all a target, so. No, I think this was a very targeted attack. Well, that stinks. Yeah. That's good. You'd be good with voiceover work. It'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be nice. There's a lot of agencies here, so. Good. Never know. Well, speaking of which... It's funny because one of the crit one criticism that's come up a lot in comments is people calling me like too monotone, but uh, th this is like true crime content. It's pretty serious stuff. So I mean, how's it at how's it apropos if I'm gonna read it like a game show host, right? Exactly. Well, that's what, but but that's what your fans love about you, though. I mean, I was drawn to you because of the tone of your voice and how you speak. So you chopped them into ten pieces. <laughs> Put two in the refrigerator and fry the rest. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you guys want me to read it, then it's going to be a really different story. But the whole reason we listen is because Morgan does it the way he does it. So, hello. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I'm if I do commercials, I'm going to speak in a different way, of course. I mean, yeah. Got to sound more enthusiastic, but uh, yeah, you know, if you these these scripts don't demand that you be so much livelier. And I mean, I've listened to other true crime podcasts, and mm -hmm. no one else talks that way either. Like the sword and scale guy, he, nope. he, he pretty much, I guess he's kind of similar to the way I talk. He speaks yeah. uh, in a steady monotone, I suppose, you know. Yep. Yeah. He. I mean, just the, it's got the music, and but when you get into it, it's all seriousness, man. There's not. It's not fun and games. We're talking about murders. Yeah. I mean, you torture, know. rape, 
and child molestation and all that kind of oh my god speaking of molestation um what was the last guy you did what was his name uh that was uh randy craft or what randy. was his fucking problem with putting things in people's orifices yeah that was fuck and he did it before god jesus yep. That was done before they died, too. So I know, I, but I'm hoping that they were passed out is what I read. Oh, another thing I want to bring up. I was listening to I was listening to this, I remember. I'm like, note this. Talk about it. How the fuck do you overdose somebody on Tylenol? You got to give well, them a lot of Tylenol. If you took a large quantity, I think, yeah, it would probably Jeez. knock them out. Like, Or if you got Tylenol 3, because I took that for a little while after I got surgery and it's almost like Oxycontin. It can like put you to sleep. It can yeah, it's codeine in it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he always but he always administered that along with like alcohol. So yeah, plus if you mix them together. We yeah. love you guys for listening. And sorry if I was a little down this week, but it was a really really rough last week. I, I lost a um, animal family member they've had for a very long time. So. Yes, yeah, her fur, ba- fur baby. Furless, my furless baby, my hairless cat I had for 16 years passed away. Um, I knew it was coming, but it was still difficult. Yeah, so. that's never that's never easy at all. No. Was, how old How old was she again? She was 16. 16. That's a long time. Yeah, my little baby girl, but she's at peace now, and I was with her when she passed, very calmly and in my arms so i guess that's the best way you can go well it's like other unlike uh most other human relationships like friendships the, the animal's always there so it's like oh yeah she's been through everything 16, with me 16 years of you know that intimacy so that's absolutely when you break that yeah yep yep that's why i'm just well need a break <laughs> yeah yeah, well, right. Well, our energy should be back up next week, I'm sure. Yes, let's hope. Gosh. I hope, all, I hope all you guys had a better week than we did. If not, yes. If not, send us send us that positive energy, please. Yeah, yes. That. <laughs> For sure. All right. So let, here's hoping life is not going to be a dick to any any of us <laughs> within the next week. <laughs> Thank you. I, I I concur. Thanks for listening, guys, and from Morgan Rector and Rachel Telfer. Have yourself a great week. Take care. Bye. Bye.